Welcome to our virtual event, Don't Let Safety Slip, Preventing Slips, Trips, and Falls. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Dick. I'm a, my background is in nursing. I'm a certified occupational health nurse and prevention consultant with Safe Work Manitoba. Hi, Jen, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Gail Archer Hayes. I'm an occupational therapist, and I work as a prevention consultant for Safe Work Manitoba. Safe Work Manitoba is a division of the Workers' Compensation Board of Manitoba, and it is a public agency dedicated to the prevention of workplace injury and illness. Working with our partners in the safety community, we provide prevention education, safety programming, consulting, and strategic direction to create a genuine culture of safety for all Manitobans. Before we begin, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. In an effort to ensure we comply with public health COVID-19 protocols, including physical distancing, Gail and I are presenting from separate locations. Some of this presentation has been pre-recorded to ensure we are able to deliver clear information. There will be some live portions, including polls, where we ask for your participation. Please use the Q&A box if you have any questions or technical issues during the presentation. We will do our best to respond throughout. If we are unable to give you an accurate response, Following this presentation, we will compile all the questions and post the responses on our website. The recording of this presentation will also be posted at a later date on the Safe Work Manitoba YouTube channel. It is also important to note this presentation is not a substitute for legal or health advice and should not be relied on as such. Viewers should seek their own legal and health advice and or follow workplace procedures. Thanks for getting us started, Jen. And now to let you know what you're in for during this session. The mandate of Safe Work Manitoba is to prevent injuries, and today we're going to focus on just that, the prevention strategies for the reduction of slips, trips, and falls in the workplace. We have structured our time together to include the definition of what is meant by slips and trips. We often refer to these hazards as one word, but they're actually separate events. What characteristics make them unique from one another? We will also touch upon why we should be concerned, which will include some, to some statistics and injury information. The bulk of the presentation will look at nine ways to prevent falls from slips and trips in your workplace, areas of concern and what we can do about it, including some organizational strategies moving forward. And finally, we will introduce you to some new research and innovative equipment to help your organization make it happen. Thanks, Gail. To get us started, we're going to break down these three very important topics. Essentially, a slip happens when we step on something and our foot slides. It is caused when there's too little friction between your feet and the surface you are walking on. When we slip, we often slip backwards because we are in a forward momentum while walking and our feet tend to move out in front of us. That's right, Jen. Your body is happiest when the top half is right over top of your bottom half. Trips occur when an obstacle causes your lower half to stop suddenly and your upper half to keep going. The faster you're traveling at that time, the greater the chance of falling, often in a forward direction. Thanks, Gail. When we slip or trip, we might lose our balance so much that we fall to the ground and could be injured. What's also interesting is that the motion of trying to stop our falls could also result in an injury such as a strain or a sprain. Today, we will only speak to falls on the same level. Let's start with a pole. What percentage of injuries reported to the WCB were caused by slips, trips, and falls from the same level in 2019? Thank you for your response. The answer is actually D. This is significant because that equates to almost one in five accepted injuries related to slips, trips, and falls in 2019. We can see that this is an issue for Manitoba workers. Injuries from a slip, trip, or fall can vary widely. As we can see in this slide, injuries can be in the form of a bump, bruise, or contusion, laceration, or fracture, or may result in a severe head injury or death in severe cases. It is not unusual for someone to experience several injuries from one slip, trip, or fall. If we take an example of someone walking into a building where a mat might be folded over, they may trip and fall forward, often extending their hands in front of them. In this example, we might see hands, knees, and potentially an injury to the neck and back from the impact. Several injuries could occur. Falling is a very frightening prospect. We are hardwired to avoid it at all costs. 
As Jen shared, the potential of injury is very real, so it is up to us to make changes to eliminate or reduce any risk factors. In fact, there is legislation in place to ensure that these hazards are identified and managed in the workplace. The employer has a very significant role to play when it comes to keeping workers safe. The role is guided by the legislation provided to workplaces in the Manitoba Workplace Safety and Health Act. This is it here. This is what it looks like. There are three parts that pertain to slip, trip, and fall prevention. First, there's part four, which is the general workplace requirements, and then part 13, which addresses ed entrances and exits. Both deal with making sure that surfaces are kept in good repair and clear of obstacles. It even refers to ensuring adequate friction for uh, safe movement. Then there's the musculoskeletal injury uh, prevention portion, or MSIs. It states that workplaces must first assess a hazard, then put controls in place, monitor the effectiveness of that control, and then finally inform workers and train the workers. This means that as an employer, if you are aware of a hazard or should have been aware of a hazard, then there's an obligation to have it assessed for risk and controls put in place. So now Jen's gonna tell us how a workplace goes about an assessment. Thanks, Gail. This slide is a key part about what Gail just talked about. One of the most important things we can do from legislation is to conduct a risk assessment. Consider the SAFE acronym. When we spot the hazard, what are we looking for? You may consider adding slips, trips, and falls to the inspection checklist. This might also include a review of areas of concern, such as parking lots or entrances, or an analysis of injuries or near misses related to slips, trips, and falls. When we assess the risk, we assess the level of risk for each of the identified hazards. This might be done by reviewing how many workers are exposed to the hazard, how severe the injury could be, and how frequent the exposure might happen. Once we've done this, it's time to find a safer way. This is done using the hierarchy of controls. You may need to personalize your control measures to the workplace, but the end result could impact the number of slips, trips, and falls. Finally, every day. Working every day to ensure that workers are aware and trained to identify the hazards and reduce the risk. Working together as a team can make a difference. WorkSafe BC has a great document that I have read to answer this question. Check out the link in the resources section on our website. And to further understand the hazards, we'd like to share a video that will summarize some of the slip, trip and fall hazards you might see daily and how with your help, we can try to reduce and prevent these types of injuries from occurring. Slips, trips, and falls may not be the things you think of when you think about workplace injuries. But every year, hundreds of workers are injured by slips, trips, and falls resulting in injuries that range from minor cuts and bruises to significant injuries that require hospitalization and long recovery times. Slips, trips, and falls are common injuries because every day, we encounter the potential hazards that can cause them. Things like wet or oily surfaces, including occasional spills, weather hazards like ice, slush, snow, or wet leaves, loose or wrinkled rugs or mats, uneven flooring or surfaces such as steps or thresholds, surfaces with different degrees of traction like loose gravel or pavement, obstructed views, poor lighting, clutter or other obstructions including things like loose cables or open bottom drawers. So how can you prevent slips, trips and falls from occurring? Some steps that can be taken include cleaning all spills on walking surfaces, barricading wet or uneven areas to prevent people from walking there, removing obstacles from walkways, and keeping walkways free from clutter. Covering cables placed on walking surfaces. Ensuring walkways are well lit by replacing bulbs and repairing faulty light switches. Securing loose mats, rugs, cables and cords. Closing low file cabinet or storage drawers. Highlighting the edge of uneven surfaces, such as stairs, 
You can also take your own steps to reduce the risk of slips, trips, and falls. Make sure you always wear the proper footwear for the job, including anti-slip footwear. Take your time and pay attention to where you're walking. Walk with caution if the surface is uneven or conditions make it riskier. Help keep walking surfaces clear and in good condition. Make sure you have enough light to see properly. And make sure that if you're carrying objects, they aren't blocking your view. Slips, trips, and falls may be common, but they don't have to be. Not when you take the proper steps and use safe work. For more information on preventing slips, trips, and falls, as well as preventing other workplace injuries, visit safemanitoba.com. As we have mentioned, our focus for today is going to be on prevention. How do we prevent slips, trips, and falls? We saw several hazards presented in the video and we know they cause too many injuries to Manitoba workers. With the help of research, we have come up with the top nine list of items to keep in mind when preventing slips, trips, and falls. We will go through these in more detail. Thanks, Jen. Now we're going to start with planning for inclement weather. Manitoba is blessed with four distinct seasons, but with that comes variable weather. Snow, rain, and ice can all wreak havoc on maintaining a strong footing and preventing slips and trips. Winter and spring are the highest risk seasons for slip, trips, and falls. We call them the transition months. Of the two, the most crucial is the change from fall to winter. Employers need to be particularly diligent during these transition periods because workers are not quite yet used to the changes in the weather. In the wintertime, employers need to put into place policies such as snow clearing, like when shoveling will occur and then who does it. Workers need to get their footwear ready ahead of time so they're not caught off guard. Once it has arrived, they need to take a bit of extra time to account for this poor weather. The days alternate between melt and freeze, so workers need to make sure they have good balance and are constantly making adjustments to their gait, speed and foot placement before moving. They need to keep their feet flat and knees bent so that their muscles are ready to respond to any unexpected movement. And they need to pay special attention to where and how they are walking. Practice makes perfect. It's also important that they get into the habit of clearing ice off their shoes and work boots and changing their footwear once indoors to prevent slipping once inside. This is how Manitobans adjust for winter. I just wanted to add in another additional to inclement weather, but we also have to deal with other slippery conditions outside, such as leaves, spring garbage, and insect debris. If anyone has seen canker worm goo in the spring, you know what I mean. We will now move into housekeeping. We know that safety is everyone's responsibility. This includes housekeeping practices. Keeping the walkways free of debris or obstructions is something that we can all do. If we all adopt good habits, we can help to eliminate these hazards. Getting into the habit of constantly scanning our environment for hazards and being mindful of changes in our environment will help to reduce these hazards. Debris such as strapping from a box or obstructions such as cords across walking paths could cause someone to slip or trip. If we see this, it is important to communicate immediately to the appropriate person. When it comes to flooring or mats, worn out flooring itself can also pose a risk. Workers need to contact their supervisor on the, or maintenance department if any areas are frayed, chipped, damaged, or torn. Mats that are worn out, bunched up, or flipped over can pose a risk, as Jen had mentioned. I know that often the first tendency is to tape down the edges, but make sure it's a temporary fix, as the tape will dry out and cause an even greater hazard in two to three days when it begins to curl up higher than the mat was in the first place. Products that can spill at a workplace can vary widely from industry to industry, but even if it's just a leaky faucet or spilled coffee, spills are a fact of life at every worksite. When this happens, be sure to block it off with pylons or other obstacles and follow workplace procedures to have it cleaned up as soon as possible. It is not unusual for housekeeping staff to leave behind freshly mopped but wet floor. In this case, workers can be warned of a slippery floor with the use of a caution sign. Having solid housekeeping policies can contain language that targets response time in terms of managing spills. One workplace we know of uh, significantly reduced their slip injuries by changing the response time to just under 10 minutes. Slips can be reduced with appropriate footwear. What can you tell us about that, Jen? 
That brings us to our third prevention tip, footwear. As we know, footwear comes in all shapes and styles. While it is important to reduce slip and trip hazards in the workplace, it is also a good idea to wear shoes that will protect you from them. The footwear that you choose to wear should be comfortable, provide adequate support and protection for the job, and have heels and soles that are suitable for the surfaces you will be walking on. We typically hear of boots being CSA approved, as they are considered PPE. However, workplaces might consider a footwear policy that speaks to safety, comfort, and anti-slip qualities. This might include protection from slip, trip, and fall hazards. You might even consider a footwear risk assessment to identify some of the hazards and incorporate these into policy in an effort to protect employees. For our second poll, we'd like you to answer this question. What type of footwear do you wear for work every day? Wow, thank you for your responses. As you can see, we have many sorts of footwear on the line today. Thank you again for your participation in the poll. Our next slides will talk further about footwear and the importance of wearing footwear appropriate to the tasks that you are doing. It is interesting, Jen, that we have such specialized footwear for different work sectors. Common to all sectors, however, is that the heels of your shoes are especially crucial to consider. Most slips occur when there's not enough friction between the heel and the walking surface. To get a secure grip, the heels of your shoes should be low and wide. Then, second most important is consideration of the construction of the soles of the shoes or boots. For example, in healthcare, because they're on their feet all day, healthcare workers will tend to choose footwear that is both supportive and comfortable. Runners are usually the first choice as they check all the boxes. However, they must pay attention also to the soles of the shoes as well. Not all runners are created equal. In fact, some of the synthetic soft rubber soles common to runners, Crocs and walking shoes are great for gripping dry surfaces, but may be very slippery when wet. The service sector has different challenges. Restaurant workers, for example, those who work in the back of the house, wear sturdy shoes with anti-slip properties because of the potential of water and grease spills in the kitchen area. The servers, meanwhile, working in the front of the house may be obligated to wear more fashion-related footwear. You can appreciate the risk uh, for servers who now enter into the kitchen because fashion footwear is not usually designed with anti-slip properties. The risks are multiplied with high heels. High heels might look, might look nice, but they provide very little traction for your feet and can catch on carpet and other irregularities in the floor. High heels also make you naturally unstable because they raise your center of gravity. So the best choices for servers are low profile shoes with some anti-slip properties in the soles. There's also specialized footwear for workers in construction, agriculture, infrastructure, and manufacturing. Jen, can you tell us a bit more about the treads found in those industries? Sure, Gail. This is one of my favorite slides. When we talk about other sectors, such as manufacturing, construction or infrastructure, and agriculture, they might be using various styles of work boots. But did you know that boots come in a variety of treads and soles? When looking at these boots, you might consider treads and what they're used for. WorkSafe BC has a great document that contains some very interesting information about footwear and features to look for. Did you know that a tread pattern and soles should be looked at depending on where you might be walking? As we can see in the chart above, a smaller, deeper tread pattern with a flexible sole might be better when walking in liquid. This might include when working outdoors in the rain or in a hospital kitchen area. Alternatively, if you're walking in gravel, tread patterns with a wider channel and flexible sole might allow for better traction. To read more, check out WorkSafe BC's bulletin on slips, trips and falls in manufacturing. The next slide is going to give you a different perspective. You're going to smile when you see the new type of treads. When walking in wind winter weather, our best bet is to walk like a penguin. After all, penguins do not fall down. Check out this video by the Alberta Health Services. Oh, 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 oh,
great video. I'm not sure that penguins would be entering our workplaces on a regular basis, but let's take a look at the importance of flooring. When you walk into your workplace, what do your floors look like? As Gail mentioned earlier, we live in Manitoba. We have four distinct seasons with potential for any type of weather. If water is tracked in, it can create a slip hazard to those walking after you. Alternatively, if sand is tracked in, a worker's foot could roll over the sand, creating a fall potential. Using a textured strip on the flooring can help to give workers some traction on surfaces that might become slippery. This might also be used on stairs. A floor drain could be used to let the water drain away from the walking area, or a brush mat or mat that might collect sand, dirt, or water might be beneficial to remove some of these hazards. Gail, there are so many types of flooring. What can you tell us about flooring to help in minimizing these hazards? It's true, Jen. During our research, I was really surprised to find out that different walking surfaces provide varying degrees of friction that is needed for your feet to get a secure grip. For instance, did you know that carpeting provides a better grip than smooth tile? Or dry tile floor provides a better gr grip than a floor that is wet? You can avoid slipping by being aware of the type of surface you're walking on and how much traction it can provide. For example, there are three different kinds of walking surfaces. One is non-slip. It provides adequate traction no matter whether it's wet or dry. Then there's moderately slippery, which is somewhat slip resistant when dry, but can be very slippery when wet. And then there's slippery. These surfaces do not provide much traction at all. They look great, but they can be treacherous whether wet or dry. So what kinds of flooring do you have in your workplace? And do you have more than one type? I was surprised to learn that most of the most slippery surfaces inside a building tend to be near entrances, washrooms, and around machinery. Apparently the flooring in this area is also made of moderately slippery surfaces, which can be like skating rinks when they're wet. So during the wet or snow seasons, these areas could be covered up with non-slip materials such as rubber mats or carpeting. Now Jen has some interesting information ahead. I do, Gail. Did you know that not only does flooring have an impact, but even the slightest level change can create a hazard? If you think about the times you may have tripped, was it when you were walking to your car in the parking lot and you didn't see the slight change in elevation from the speed bump? Or maybe you didn't see that the road had a crack sticking up? As little as a half inch can create a hazard. When we walk, our feet tend to only come off the ground approximately half of an inch. If the ground is sticking up, our foot can catch that and we could trip. A safety memo video I recently watched about slips, trips, and falls dubbed this the fatal half inch. This is why regular maintenance of all walking surfaces is so important in the prevention of this hazard. Gail, can you tell us more about what to do to prevent this in parking lots? When taking into consideration that only half an inch can make a difference between staying upright or sustaining a potential fall or a serious injury, parking lots take on a whole new light. Because they're outside and constantly weathered, they can easily deteriorate with weather, sunshine, and time exposure, creating a minefield of hazards. So how do we avoid that from happening? Regular inspections can be useful in finding divots, ridges, and other weathering anomalies. Of course, if these exceed the half inch threshold, then they should be marked with high visibility paint and reported for repair. Sometimes car stops and speed bumps can prevent present a trip hazard for someone not watching their feet. These can be made more visible by painting with high visibility paint as well. You want to keep all walking surfaces as dry as possible, including parking lots as this is where the bulk of your outside walking traffic will occur. Grease and oil from cars can be an issue and must be dealt with as a spill. For example, one can contain the area with pylons spread on an absorbent material over the area and then sweep it up and dispose of according to your spill protocols. And workers should walk with added care across parking lots as even the accumulation of sand, grit and granular materials can make surfaces more slippery, especially if you get pieces stuck into the tread of your shoes. But in Manitoba, once again, it's the inclement weather that causes the most grief. We would suggest that as an organization, prepare for the worst. You might consider earmarking September to check your sand and salt supplies. Make sure the sand warmer, if you have one, is in operating condition and ready to go. Sand and salt should be placed in strategic places and for easy access. You don't want to be caught off guard. Some workplaces have their own on-site snow removal equipment while others contract out that service. Policy and the language of the contract will help to 
to define snow clearing expectations, such as when to begin. For example, if your workplace runs on a 24 hour clock, you might want snow clearing to begin within half an hour of the initiation of a snowfall. Or if you have a day shift only, then you might state that snow clearing should begin one hour before the first shift begins. State what is, needs to be cleared as well, be it entrances, sidewalks, or the entire parking lot. For our final poll, we would like to an you to answer, are there any guidelines or standards for stairs? Thank you again for participating. The answer is yes. There are guidelines and codes that must be met when we talk about stairs and ramps. As you can see in this photo, these five factors should be considered. You can check out two very important resources, the Manitoba Building Code and the Accessibility for Manitobans Act. These documents provide valuable information around stairs and ramps. Thank you for participating. This takes us to our sixth tip paying attention to stairs and ramps. This is one of my favorite slides because stairs and ramps are so important to get to places within our workplaces and homes. Do you know why it is so important to have an engineered stair? When stairs are not consistently engineered, a small change in the height can cause you to trip because your brain is detecting the height is the same the entire length of the stairs. We know that even a half inch difference in riser height can create a trip hazard. Also, if the stairs or ramps have a crack, it could create a hazard for all who use. Regular maintenance or painting the edges can help to minimize these. Handrails are also an important topic. Using the handrails will help to keep you balanced and give you more points of contact. Now I know that some of you might say, but those are so dirty. If this is you, consider using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer or washing your hands after using them. Regular cleaning will also help. We might also feel like we are in a hurry and might either try to run up the stairs or skip stairs and do two at a time. I challenge you to reconsider and walk those stairs. It's safer and you still get the same amount of exercise. If ramps become wet, icy or snow packed, they may become very slick, making it difficult for a person in a wheelchair using crutches or pulling a hand truck to get up or down. Regularly checking for snow and ice buildup, using salt or use of a high friction mat or runner down the middle might be helpful for traction. Thanks, Jen. Our next tip deals with vision. After all, you need to be able to see hazards in order to avoid them. Some of this information may not be new or a surprise for you as you glance over the slide, but there are a couple issues that I'd like to highlight. What most people don't realize that a big issue for vision, and I'm, I'm beginning to understand as I age, is contrast. Older workers especially have more difficulty distinguishing surfaces when the colors are flat and blended together. Have you ever skied in cloud or, or uh, fog? Then you know that you just cannot see the bumps in the snow. It's the same for the ground or other uneven surfaces. So setting light at an angle, both inside and outside a workplace, can increase the contrast by producing shadows, which makes it easier to detect bumps and other irregularities. You can also use color contrast to assist with depth perception, which can make a big difference as well. This could be like having a colored feature wall or a combination of light and dark accents in your workplace. I'd like to take a moment too to just talk about with sight lines to talk about wearing bifocals. These lenses are designed to have a shortened focal length for short vision, like reading. So by, by, by their very nature, they're not going to be useful for seeing the ground. In fact, the ground will be blurry and unclear. So what do we do to make this safer? I found that, that with these safety glasses. So I was very excited to buy these safety glasses with readers into this, placed into the bottom. This was great for inspections going into workplaces. I can see what I'm writing on a clipboard as I look around. However, what I found was I could not see the ground and I was in a cement plant with a very uneven surface. So what I learned from that is, and but this will pertain to people wearing bifocals and also for all of us now as we're wearing masks during the pandemic, that you need to take an extra care to look at the ground, to bend your head a little bit forward so that you can see out of the regular part of the, of the lens. Take extra care, scan the environment ahead of time and take note of any obstructions. Watch where your feet are landing and use handrails wherever they're available. The last part of this slide deals with people who work outside all the time, such as farmers, hydro workers, postal workers. So they're always used to getting the elements into their eyes that's going to obscure vision, such as sun glare, 
and weather, sleet, snow, and rain? The, some of the answers to this is a hat. Wear a hat, but with a brim, the brim to protect against both of those elements. Secondly, try polarized sunglasses. They're a little more expensive, but boy, they're well worth it when it comes down to cutting glare. And in rough weather, workers may want to try eye shields just so that they can keep their eyes free. So all in all, being able to see is very useful for staying upright. Let's take a few minutes to talk about how all of these items work together. When we talk about safety culture, we really want you to set the tone for the organization you work for. Your attitudes and beliefs about safety can be infectious. We know that a culture change should start from leadership. When leaders set the example, it really does filter down to the rest of the organization. We also know that one person can make the difference. Will you be that one person? Can you start to walk the talk and make an effort to wear the appropriate footwear for the task you are doing? As we've already talked about, safety is a responsibility of everyone at the workplace. We also want to bring attention to the distraction of texting or talking on the phone when you are walking. How many of you have seen that person walking and not paying attention? When we are mindful, we reduce our chances of injuring ourselves. As always, it is important that if we do remind each other, that we do it in a kind manner. Even as times are a little stressful, a gentle reminder to use the tools we can to help us can go a long way. Workplaces who work together are capable of successfully changing their safety culture. Wellness campaigns can be fun for workplaces and a very effective way of getting the message out to large numbers of people. The goal is often to elevate awareness. This can be as simple as a poster to a full day or a six month event. Planning a campaign is best when the workers and or prevention committee are in on the planning of the events. We know an employer who engaged their workers in a slip, trip and fall campaign, which turned out to be very effective in reducing their injuries. It started in October, which is a transition month, and ran all the way to March, another transition month. So consider these components to make yours a success. Consider a media blitz. Many workplaces have closed circuit TVs in common areas so that you can run information blitzes such as fun facts, gentle reminders, or information on upcoming events. You could consider contests and offering incentives or giveaways. One employer ran a draw for employees who purchased snowflake rated treads from work, Rate My Treads. The prize was a day off work. We'll talk about more about Rate My Treads very shortly. Poster campaigns Coat the workplace with visuals, posted in lunchrooms, locker rooms, and all common areas. You might consider a campaign of safety talks, shop talks, and safety swaps to cover slip, trip, and fall related topics. You can also consider a mindfulness month, reminder wor reminding workers to slow down and take care, take their breaks, and to be kind to themselves and to one another. So all in all, the goal is to make safety language the common language in your workplace and to get everybody involved. Thanks, Gail. Those are some great campaign ideas. Did you also know that there's innovative research and products available to help in the reduction of slips, trips, and falls? We will tell you about a few innovative ideas that we have seen. Please note that these are only innovations. We have not tested or trialed any of these products. My first go for innovative research is Rate My Treads. Rate My Treads is on a free website hosted by iDAPT. This is a research arm of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and the University Health ne Network in Toronto. They believe that choosing the right footwear can reduce and prevent unintentional slips and falls. So they have done research to understand more about the mechanics of, of slipping. They have developed the world's only human-oriented slip-resistant testing method done in a real weather environment. They place people into harnesses with different brands of winter boots. Then they angle the floor beneath them to see how high the angle can get before the person begins to slip. The higher the angle, the higher the rating, giving the boots a zero, one, two, or three snowflake rating based on their anti-friction properties on ice. Then they post these results on the work, on the website. This is really fun because now you can go to that website and see how your own boots rate. But don't worry if they're not there. It could be that they just haven't tested them yet. Workplaces can use this as well to uh, guide their work workers into purchasing boots that are going to be effective in prevent preventing slips. Rate my treads. Check them out. That's a great website, Gail. Another great resource comes out of more research. 
an article recently published in the International Journal of Industrial Ergonomics on the effects of vibration and back injuries among long-distance truck drivers. Their research led to an interesting but unexpected find. It was found that continuous exposure to vibration, such as that experienced by truck drivers, will actually reduce your balance reactions once you stop. Balance recovers soon after the truck stops, but for the first few minutes after parking, there is an increased likelihood of falls occurring while getting out of the cab. This reinforces the need for three points of contact as you get out of the cab or off any mobile equipment. It would also be important to slow down while getting out of the truck or equipment to make sure your balance is in check. Interesting research, Jen. Now, when it comes to innovation to equipment, let's take a look at these cool boots. Often workers who are required to wear clamp-on cleats for work cite difficulty when their work site takes them back and forth between outside terrain and inside floor surfaces, such as delivery workers. The cleats are great outside as they increase the grip on the ice surface, but once inside, they can convert your shoe or boot into a skate. As a result, workers are not always wanting to wear the cleats. So look for work boots with cleats built right within them. They're often built with a knob that protrudes out from the back of the heel. All you need to do is kick it with the toe of the other boot to drop the cleats and click it again or kick it again to withdraw them. This saves a lot of time taking your cleats on and off your boots when every time you go in or out. And it reduces the risk of slipping from having hard cleats on a smooth, hard floor surface. Another innovation is a cord or hose reel. If your workplace is overwhelmed with cords and cables on the floor, there are other options, such as running them behind the wall or purchasing a battery-operated hose reel that can help you get those cords, hoses, and cables off the walkways and stored properly. I'd like to talk to you right now about coefficient of friction. This is also referred to as COF, and it is the most common measure of the relative slipperiness of a floor. It is a measuring scale that ranges from zero to one in increments of tenths of a point with zero representing the least amount of slip resistant. The neat thing is, is that we can increase the COF of any surface by adding grittier materials into it. Jen talked earlier about brush mats, but there are also mats embedded with higher COF materials, such as quartz, silica, and epoxy grit, which can help keep, your, uh, keep you on your feet, especially at entrances and doorways. It just adds that extra layer of protection. And did you know that you can also increase the COF of paint by adding grit into it? It's not usually added in when you purchase the paint, but you get a grit kit and sprinkle the chips onto the paint before it dries. That way you can control the grit intensity. And finally, I'd like to add a little bit about concrete too, especially because textured concrete has become very popular in the last 10 years. And people often wonder whether the texture increases its slip safety. In fact, it does, depending on the amount of topography that you add into the design. You can also add high COF additives directly onto the wet concrete or into the concrete sealer itself. A COF value of 0.6 or greater is considered to be high traction, and this has been clinically proven to reduce slip and trip claims by 50 to 90 percent. We have covered a lot in this presentation so far, Jen. Can you remind us of all that we've talked about? Sure can. Those are some really neat innovations. Thanks, Gail. This is what we really want you to know from our presentation today. Here are some of the main takeaways. Being in the moment and mindful will help you to slow down and focus on what you're doing. Focus on what your foot is stepping on. Where are you walking and what are you doing? Is that text really important or can it wait until you get to your destination? We don't text and drive, so we shouldn't text and walk or run for that matter. Make sure you're wearing footwear that is appropriate to the task or environment you are working in. This might include a boot or a shoe with cleats. Stick to the proper pathways so you can avoid uneven ground. You should also continuously scan the environment to make sure you are aware of what's going on around you. Carry small loads. If you can't see in front of you, then you can't see the change in elevation or the speed bump. Use tools to help you move the load if you need to and challenge yourself to channel your inner penguin and walk how they would walk. Flat feet turned outward slightly and moving slowly. Remember, you want to get to your destination unharmed. Thanks for the summary, Jen. And that concludes our presentation on Don't Let Safety Slip. As we have heard today, safety and health is a responsibility of everyone in the workplace. 
If we all work together, we can help reduce the hazards of slip, trips, and falls. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact Jen or I. Our contact information is included on this slide. All the best and stay on your feet. On behalf of SafeWork Manitoba, thank you for watching our virtual presentation and for all of the questions. We hope you are able to take away some tools and knowledge to better understand some of the ways we can work together to prevent slips, trips, and falls. We hope this will help keep you, your coworkers, and your customers safe. In the coming days, you will receive an email with a link to the resources, Q&As, and a survey. You will also be able to view the complete recording of this webinar and share it with your colleagues. Please be sure to visit safemanitoba.com to view resources. Thank you.